And welcome to all our outsourcers for um, this afternoon's session. We're going to try and keep the dialogue very much focused on your environment, your needs, your challenges, and um, try and address uh, things from a supplier point of view, um, as well as a, an employer point of view. So let's, um, without further ado, let's introduce our panel. I'd like to introduce Steve, Steve Sullivan. Steve's going to be looking after us for from a sort of contact center operations. And as you know, Steve works with the DMA uh, looking after data protection. So welcome, Steve. Morning, John. Morning, everyone. Hi. And from America, um, Brent, Brent Agar. Brent um, runs Century Bay. Um, and he's going to look after us from a technology standpoint, particularly this very sensitive area of endpoint technology. So welcome, Brent. Yeah, good morning, everyone, and happy to be here. Thank you. And, and from um, looking after things from a data security um, and infrastructure security, but also from a payments compliance standpoint, I'd like to welcome Simon from BT. Morning, Simon. Morning, John. Thanks for the invite. You're very kind, very kind. And Felix, um, Felix is going to be looking after us from a risk standpoint, particularly some of the hidden stuff that we might not easily expect. So welcome, Felix. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everybody. So um, I guess without further ado, let's, let's just put this homeworking situation in some context. And, and I guess that context is that it it was a situation that's been forced on us all. But what are the big problems? Certainly from a people, process, technology side. Steve, give us um, a quick ups, give a quick view of the upside. What, should, what, what can we be looking forward to to get out of homeworking? Uh, well, the, the upsides, I guess, are um, very initially um, a lot of kind of um, employee gratitude, very people pleased that they continue doing their jobs and earning a living. Um, from home with with a lot of help from their employers. Um, I think from a sort of cost perspective, obviously, potentially, depending on how you configure things post-COVID, there's clear cost benefits um, thus far, although the employment market's changing, there's indications that it's really helped with um, employee retention. Um, for employers, there's obviously this um, ability to access a national or even global uh, labour force, which is new. Um, and although it's slightly contested, a lot of people are saying they're seeing improved productivity um, and uh, some even claiming that they're continuing to see positive um, customer experience metrics in terms of CSAT mm -hmm. and NPS. So plenty to play for. Yeah, and of course, we've seen specialist outsourcers who who have focused entirely on this home working model, you know, and have clearly set up infrastructure and processes around supporting the people. And I guess there's a lot that we've learned from them over the years. Yeah, and I think I guess and the, you know, it's a bit like if you ask the um, how to get to Ballady Hob from where my mum lives in West Cork, you wouldn't want to start from here. And I think those specialist outsourcers have built a business solely focused around the working from home model, and all their processes and structures and culture is built around that. It's it's incredible what people managed to do 10, 11 months ago with no notice. But to do it properly, to do it the right way, takes a real shift. And I think that's probably what everybody on this call is probably experiencing right now. Yeah. Brent, give us a feel of some of the challenges from a tech standpoint. What have we, what have we got to be looking out for? What have we got to, to focus on? Well, the, uh, the major issue, and if you look at uh, the expansion of, of endpoints, so an organisation, uh, we're working with a large insurance company, has 200 offices but now they've gone to 120,000 endpoints with all the employees working from home. So you've got this large unmanaged sort of um, area that you've now got to cover. It's outside the, the corporate environment. So those are the challenges. The other challenges is getting actually technology to that, to that user. How do you distribute it safely? Um, and then you know, apply those protections that you know they're running and working uh, why they're connecting to the uh, context centers um, software. Yeah, and, and from an overview, Simon, you you must have a whole bunch of contact centers that BT are looking after, as well as third parties, outsources, that you've got a duty of care as a merchant 
to look after. So what, what's been top of your agenda over the last year? So I've spent a lot of time engaging with our third party contact centres and their um, representative colleagues, you know, the, I can't think of the terminology now, the, 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 the middleman between me and the third party, I guess, it'll come to be in a minute. Um, and we've done a lot of review of scope, you know, so they're coming to me and saying, hey, Simon, we want to, you know, um, a third party contact centre wants to, you know, move their workforce to working from home. How do we sit on that? So, of course, from a payments compliance point of view is reviewing the paperwork. And one thing that's become obvious to us as a QSA community is obviously working from home is never really mentioned in the actual detail of the certificates from the PCI's point of view. So, you know, we're having to engage a lot more with the third parties. And I'm seeing a lot of um, happy people to engage, you know, explain what it is, demonstrate how they can meet the, the compliance requirements externally, but then also have a lot of questions around us and how we're impacting them and their PCI compliance, because, you know, if BT are engaging with third parties and asking them to work from home to meet the obligations, it's, well, you know, what do we need to do and, and how do we do that proactively? So there's the, the compliance piece, there's the, the, the training and education of the, the, the um, agents, there's the technology solutions we're providing to them as well. And then obviously down to the legal documentation, because of course it's an ex outside the scope of the remit today. So I'm having to put all hats on and review all all areas. Um, you know, and to answer, there's a, there's a question in the, in the chat bit about you know compliantly taking payments from home. What alternatives are there? So one of the things that we're doing with our partners is we're implementing mechanisms for de-scoping the payment data, so actually removing it from their environment, therefore reducing their scope of PCI implications. Thanks for that. Cup of tea. Cup of tea. <laughs> None of us Red light must be off. Yeah, None this of us have been looked after like you are, Simon. You're, yeah. you're blessed. You're I am blessed. spoiled. So my working from home scenario is ideal. I enjoy working from home and I plan to work from home for the near future. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we had tea like that, I think we'd all be happy. Yes. Hey, look, we're going to come back to this thing about scope and payments later on. So I don't want to feel as though we've um, overlooked it in any way, shape or form. But I wanted to go through to Felix because I think as employers, um, home working put some obligations on us and thinking Health and Safety at Work Act and so forth. Felix, give us a feel for what we should be mindful of from a risk standpoint, not just now, but overlooking over the next few months. I mean, I mean, like Simon, my work from home is a situation is lovely. I mean, it's great, but there are people now who are, you know, you can't sit on your bed all day and, and hope to do work. I and mean, it's just too hard people using the ironing board to, to put computers on, etc. So, I mean, that's got, that's clearly got to change. And at the moment, this is sort of um, blitz spirit. We're all going to get through it together type thing. And that, that to a great extent is, is, is um, reflected in the great sort of levers of, uh, of risk fundamentally, which are around HSE, leg health safety legislation, um, where there's a real sort of wait and see situation from the government. They're looking at it, but that's gonna change with those. I'll do the UK perspective, because that's my area. In, in the same way, the insurance industry is very much waiting and seeing. But they don't know what the, the risks are, they don't know what the claims profile is gonna be. So there's going to be some, there's definitely going to be some, um, some, some uplift in, in um, uh, the, the actual policies and, and the cost of policy. But we don't know what the union's going to do. Um, they're also looking at it very closely, um, but they're also in wait and see mood. Um, and then behind that, you've got the claims industry, uh, which is looking for a new, for a new toy. They've lost the, uh, they've lost the road traffic stuff now. So they're looking for a new one. And, and, um, you know, injuries at home, uh, mental health issues, they're pretty, pretty classic. So the leadership is looking through a dark glass here at the moment, which is very difficult. However, the, the sheer economic advantage of this is so strong that I think we're going to have to start, you know, looking at this risk seriously and taking, and taking steps now. And I think it's, it's inevitable this is going to happen. Now. Yeah, so, so there's a big upside, clearly in cost reduction, but there are some downsides from a increasing um, the footprint of what you've got to look after. And a big part of that, of course, is the endpoints. Um, Brent, um, just expand a little more on this expansion of endpoints. And, and I suspect that a lot of organizations have probably provided hardware for the hope work at home. But for those who haven't, what, what are the big risks? 
Yeah, obviously the uh, typically if it's if it's not corporate hardware, they're using some form of BYOD machine, and those machines have uh, much more vulnerability because they're they, they're used in many different ways. Uh, an example for us is just before the end of the year, uh, one of the larger third-party call centres contacted us. They had a PCI requirement which was urgently needed to be filled around the risk of what we call keyloggers and uh, remote screen capture on their um, workforce that had been forced home um, to fill that gap. So it's not only data that is held at rest or transmitted, there's a risk of actually entering the, the data into the, uh, into the machine and actually viewing it. And this is something that the PCI auditors have picked up on. And we're also seeing that by bank regulators um, and we insurance industry for agents working remotely, all those sort of areas. So for the outsourcers with a, a broad range of clients, not just taking payments, but entering sensitive data through the desktop, criminals deploying call loggers are going to capture all of that unless, they're, um, unless there's some sort of technology to prevent it, I guess. Correct. But, got it. I think we've got a short demo film of the technology that you've built, Brent, that solves this problem, this call logger problem, because it's a high degree of malware that includes call logger, isn't it? Okay, let's have a look at this. It's just a short video. Hopefully we'll... Um... Thank you very much for joining us on this video demonstration. Today we're going to be showing how some very simple software can help you achieve your PCI compliance by mitigating key logging and screen capture. So without further ado, let's jump straight in. So our first job will be to enable our visual representation of a key logger and a screen capture tool. Then we're going to log into our Office 365 portal and load our Dynamics 365 CRM. So in this example, you can see already in our keylogger in the bottom left hand corner of the screen, our credentials have been stolen. We have username and password. So as you can see, we are logging into our Dynamics Office 365. We're going to create a new customer and enter some personal information. Let's just zip through this. Now, you can see that we've got key keystrokes have been exfiltrated. And now we can see us signing into Office 365 through our screen capture tool and entering our personal information. This is a really easy attack vector, and it may be something that's not just utilized by malicious actor, it could be the employee. So here we're gonna enable a simple piece of software, it's called the Armored Client, and what it does is scrambles keystrokes and prevents screen capture. So again, we're gonna enable our visual keylogger and our screen capture tool. So opening our browser, and logging into Office 365, we can see that the keyboard scrambler in the browser is showing our scrambled keys and our key logger is reflecting that information. And we can already see that our credentials have been protected, they're safe, and let's log into Dynamics. And again, we can go and create our customer and we can enter that personal information. So we're going to zip through this again. 
And as you can see in the bottom left hand corner, the key, key logger has been defeated. So we haven't got credentials, we haven't got keystrokes or personal information. And let's go and check our screen capture tool. And as you can see, there has been no screen captures. The software prevents screen capture from taking place in protected applications, but allowing the desktop to still be viewed. This is especially useful in this day and age when we're using screen shares with video conferencing systems such as Teams, Zoom, so on and so forth. Thank you so much for your time, everybody. If you do have any questions, would like to learn more about the advanced features, please do get in touch. Thanks for that, JP. Brent, just give us a feel for the organizations that are using this type of software and um, the feedback you've had from those customers. Yeah, so primarily uh, before COVID, we actually, our 95% of our business was employees working from home. So there, you know, there was a move from four people to work from home because of their benefits um, and COVID just accelerated that. So, you know, we obviously, we have uh, call centers wanting it for PCI compliance. We have banks, uh, we have the US government. Um, um, and it's, it, don't, it doesn't only protect things like Office 365, but typically the organization will be running like a VDI session, Citrix or VMware. Um, we, so we protect the logins and everything entered in there. Um, but the application can, can protect any sort of SaaS um, Salesforce, anything else running on that machine. Um, one of the big benefits is, is we only protect the tools that the organization is using. So it, it, there's a privacy factor around um, when the machine's not used corporate environments, then the user is, is, is not infringed on on their privacy. Got it, got it. And, and I think the rights of the employee um, are ones that have to be guarded. So you're thinking of the um, employee angle, the contact center employee angle. Um, what have we got to be doing to look after them? And I'm thinking, you know, just in terms of the breadth of working from home rather than working in the office where they can be supported. Uh, John, was that for me or the other? Oh, sorry, for Steve. So I was thinking for Steve, just from an HR point of view, a contact center agent point of view. Yeah, yeah I, I suppose really, I think, um, it, early days of, of COVID, I was talking to somebody saying, well, if you haven't changed the way you manage and engage your employees, or you haven't felt the need to with everybody going to work from home, then you weren't doing it very well in the first place. Um, so it's about doing all the things that the best employers and the best outsourcers have always done, but doing it in a distributed remote environment. And that can entail an awful lot of changes, you know, right away through from, you know, what, what do our potential employees look like how do we identify them you know how, how do we assess their competence for a, a different sort of role doing the same thing but in a different way and um you know through the selection and training and do you bring people in to train do you do it solely distributed it goes back to the point about the pure play home-based providers versus those who are either consciously planning to run a hybrid model or are having to run a hybrid model because that's what the world has done to us over the last few months um and it's really hard and as in everything to do with contact centers, I think most of the pressure then ends up with that supervisory level and they could be stressed. They've been disrupted. They've been taken out of their comfort bubble. And the way that most good first line supervisors in contact centers do that very difficult job is by going up and talking to people is by literally side by side, you know, and having a splitter switch or whatever it might be. The worst ones are remote and, and sit behind a, a PC monitor. So all those contact center basics that I'm sure, I hope, most people on this call are actually really good at is just doing all that stuff in a different way, but to get the best outcomes from, from a workforce that are also bored, stressed, sick of it all, yeah. like the rest of us. Yeah. Well, if that covers the people angle and we look at the process and technology bit, but before we do that, I want to get... I want to come back to you, Simon, <clears throat> and I want to get something very clear. Our audience are outsourcers. They're third parties. Yeah. Right. What are their obligations to the merchant? Now, we've, we, we know that the merchant's got a responsibility to their acquirer contractually yeah. because they can take part, card payments. 
But what's the obligation of the third party to satisfy the bank's obligations to the merchant? What are the outsourcers got to provide? What are they? How can they make sure it's easy to make sure their customers are happy, their clients are happy? Well, one of the main things I'm looking for when I engage with our third parties is a very clear description of the service they're providing and how that meets the compliance. So, for example, within many of our service providers, we provide them the tool. Okay, so we have a thin client session, we have the security and the capabilities within our tool, which we give to the outsourced contact centers. So their obligations really are around the, the people, the processes, and obviously, you know, especially working from home and COVID, what have we agreed with you from working from home? So, you know. Just just jumping in though, yeah. where are you expecting that description? That's in their, their own attestation of compliance. Yeah, correct. So, so currently, you know, pr so before COVID, you know, the um, executive summary on their AOC would have said we would provide contact center services and we include X, Y, and Z. Now, what we're seeing in the past is it didn't include anything around working from home or the technology of the use thereafter. But what I have seen is a, a number of the larger outsourcers have actually updated their certifications quite proactively. And there's a whole section in there now around home working. You know, so we've engaged with the partners very proactively to, first of all, work out, can they provide us a secure environment working from home? Because at the end of the day, we're reliant on your system. So, you know, if you're sending your agents home with BOID or corporate devices, I need to understand the scope of the applicable systems and how the security, uh, you know, work through. So both legal and contractually will agree that between us and, and the parties and then also down to the AOCs. So where they haven't got the AOC with the details around the working from home scenarios and the technologies, that's where it comes out in formal letters and agreements between us. Um, so, you know, I am seeing all of the vendors or third party contact centers uplifting the certification to include that working from home scenarios. And that's only coming about because of QSAs like myself um, who are really challenging the partners. So if I had one recommendation, one takeaway from today to the partners listening would be, you know, for those organizations you're working for in your attestation of compliance certificate, please be very clear about what you're doing around working from home. Because if you're not, then obviously you're going to get a lot more queries, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because when you get the people on the phone and you talk about the detail, you know, that, that's great engagement. Um, but really an additional point is have a responsibilities matrix. Okay, so requirement 12.8 is very specific about when engaging or providing a service to, you know, merchants, explain what it is you, you're giving them. And one of the things I look for and we BT mandate as part of our contract is a responsibility matrix. So clear definition of the boundaries. And if you're doing working from home, then let's be clear about what it is you're controlling. You know, are you responsible for the physical security? You know, what checks? So there's a question about, you know, compliance of people working from home. You know, so what is it? We're very prescriptive about what the parties will do um, when engaging with their agents. And it is to the same level um, as we do with our internal agents um, in, in in to the point that we have a second line assurance team who will review our third parties monitoring of their agents as well um so yeah i mean that that's the key takeaway from my point of view got a got a question um from sadiq hi sadiq uh good to see, can't quite see you but I know you yeah. the um sadiq's question which companies offer secure payment gateway that can be used in home working environments right now then I'm going to spin that round a little bit and come back to Simon as our compliance um, qualified security assessor. There seems to be an understanding that using a secure payment gateway makes you compliant. Let's, let's try and get back to this point from the merchant's perspective. SAQA, uh, which is everything outsourced, yeah? yeah. Um, the reduced scope, five requirements, um, 24 controls applying, right? Um, that says you can only outsource to a certified outsource. So that means a third party call center yeah. providing a valid attestation of compliance, attesting to SAQDSP. Yeah. Correct. Having a, having a payment gateway or just inputting card details into a payment gateway, listening to them on the phone, inputting them into gateway, you're still in scope, right? Correct. So that's right, it, isn't it, Simon? Yeah, so, so, you know, to answer Sadiq's question, you know, 
all payment gateways, if they want to take payments, have to be compliant with the PCI standard. Therefore, you know, you shouldn't ever use one that isn't. But, you know, I've never come across one that isn't compliant. It's about how you use it within your organization. So, you know, are you integrating into your CRM journey? You know, are you integrating into your IVR solution? So you, you're sticking customers into the IVR or in this scenario, COVID, are you giving a portal to an agent working from home? Because they are still fully in scope for PCI to all applicable controls. And that's where solutions like Brent was demonstrating on his video. Obviously, you've got screen recording, we've got call recording. Um, and when one of the weak points is if you're using BOID is you don't know what the agent's got on the home machine, what they've been web browsing, what malware they've got there. So ensuring that we've got an endpoint technology that does stuff like the key scrambling, you know, is, is key. It's still in scope for PCI. It doesn't remove anything from scope from, from PCI because the agent is always there processing because it's about the people as well, you know, the people, the technology, the processes. So when I'm looking in the AOC certification, I'm looking for that, you know, how are the home workers using, if they're using, for example, Barclays offer um, a payment gateway, there are other vendors offering payment gateways as well. Obviously, you know, it's, it's a web browser. And the assumption is that that takes the agent out of scope and, and it doesn't, you know, because the agent is hearing the credit card numbers over the telephony platform, which in this case, probably going to be IP based. So the, the whole IP based is in scope for SAQD. You've got the agent and the behavior. So not writing the numbers down, putting it directly into the portal and then also the transmission. Um, and a reminder that pause and resume does not take the environment out of scope. I came across a bid, I was doing involved in a bid for a large organization the other day, and they were telling me they were compliant and they didn't need this new, you know, um, DTMF solution for removing payment data because they had pause and resume. Um, so once we explained the scope and the controls, they realized that actually for the last few years, they had been de-scoping their environment incorrectly. Um, and that's where the telephony SIG guidance comes in and using QSAs to understand that. Yeah, so that the document, thanks for that, Simon. So the document that um, our audience should be referencing is the PCI SSC information supplement protecting telephone based card payment data published 27th of November 2018. Why I was looking for it, we wrote it, right? Yeah. yeah. So, and Simon was a great contributor to that. But have a look at that. It's a 70 page document. And um, I think it's diagram five that you should reference to look at your VoIP, whether you're in scope or not. But this whole point about pause resume is made very clear in that document. But what the document does do is put a lot of emphasis. If your agents can hear spoken card data, then everything that that, um, that voice traffic is passing through has to be secured through all 12 requirements, 365 controls within SAQ DSP. And I think just picking up on your point, Simon, about requirement 12, 12.8.5, you have to have a responsibilities matrix. Yeah. It's not an option. You know, if you want to certify, so your CEO is certifying that you're compliant, then you've got to have one. You've got to have the evidence of having one and being able to provide it for customers. And also, 12.8.2 and also 12.9, you have to provide a contractual obligation to keep all your clients' data secure whilst it's in your environment, right? And unless you're doing those two things and you can provide your clients with that, then you are falsely attesting that you're compliant. And I'd just like to add in there as well, John, that one of the things I come across as well is, especially in the contact center service providers is, you know, they've got QSA validated certificates, but looking at the scope of the requirements in there, the, the QSA not necessarily understood the, the requirements in PCI wholly, which is why the telephony, the telephony SIG guidance document came out. So I do see, you know, third parties with incorrectly scoped um, assessments. Um, and I know when I work with third parties, I act as a free resource as it was, you know, as a QSA to BT, I look after BT. So I don't charge our partners, you know, but I can't sign the homework. So they will have to go out and get that signed and validated. But I do keep seeing less frequently nowadays, obviously since 2018, but still occasionally come up with incorrectly scoped where they've gone down the CVT route 
you know, yeah. so just for those on the call, the CVT is more specific to thin client terminals on a one by one basis. So large corporate contact centers don't meet the eligibility criteria for a CVT. You know, it's, it's for the mom and pop shops or, you know, I've got someone sat in the back office. So I do, we still do see that. So I do hope, obviously, as the education and awareness goes out there, and we should have a lot of learning from COVID because I'm looking for those details and the certificates that, you know, people scope platforms appropriately and then have the the responsibility matrix to go with it so um steven um steven no. yes we can provide um sorry not you Stephen. i'm just looking at the questions here so we've got a question um yes what we'll do we'll send out um a link to the pci security standards council document it's the information supplement protecting telephone based card payment data but it, because it's 70 pages, we'll also provide you just with a short review of that document with links through the document for that. Um, so so we'll, we'll get all that afterwards and, and any questions, please fire in and we can pass them to Simon who will provide us with that QSA view rather than just a, a sort of an operational view of the guidance. Let's, we've got a few minutes left um, and we've covered the PCI piece, I think. Um, um, for sure. The, the element of, of people process technology, um, I'm keen just to expand a little more on how do we look after the total tech? What are the sort of security issues we should be looking at? Is it all from the endpoint, or are there other vulnerabilities um, in the tech stack that we should highlight? Um, Brent, kindly, you've, you've covered from the endpoint, but Simon, what are the other pieces um, of tech that um, we should be looking to secure? Where are the vulnerabilities? Well, it's the whole environment, really. Obviously, the, the core component. So, you know, Brent talked about the endpoint. Uh, the, the other one that's commonly missed is the telephony platforms themselves. Obviously, and if you've outsourced to a third party cloud service, then obviously they need to be compliant for the services providing and the, you know, the vulnerabilities. We've got the CRMs as well. But ultimately, the scope is defined as any system that is a touch point for transmission or processing of card data. It's not just the storage of card data. Okay, that, that myth needs to be gotten rid of now. Storage of card data isn't the de facto point, it is the processing and transmission. So I think we, we you know, we, we've, we've got the storage bit nailed. To the ground and we've got the pause and resume in place i think what we need to start looking at now is really the telephony products i mean we don't see too many vulnerabilities and breaches with the the i you know the voip traffic um etc but we do still need to start looking at those because i see a lot of legacy telephony platforms and dialers being used that could be compromised um yeah, I mean, that's that's a whole day's discussion in itself, but yeah, just exactly. just to put out there that it, it is not just the storage, it is the transmission and processing, so the endpoints, the agents, you know, the CRMs, the infrastructure supporting it, um, the whole vast physical security, the whole, the whole element which the PCI standard covers. So in a nutshell, for the outsourcers, they've got to make sure they've got an attestation of compliance from their cloud contact centre provider. Correct, yeah. And John, yeah. John, can I just add a point there too, that... Um, you know, one thing technology has done is brought the cost of of deployments down. So, you know, obviously the cloud has made things a lot cheaper, not the requirement for, you know, on-site servers. You know, it's the same with endpoints. So, you know, I'll give you an example. One uh, insurance client of ours was deploying 100 laptops at $1,000 each a week out to independent agents. Um, we can deploy software at a fraction of that cost and we're replacing those with putting software in. So as um, the rest of the panelists say, you know, technology has actually reduced uh, a lot of the infrastructure cost by taking advantage of it. And, and the models pay as you go, I suppose. Yeah, some of them are, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Steve, coming back to you just on an operational side now, just a little bit more about the people and process. Um, what, are, what are your what are your red flags? What do you things look out for? And I'm thinking mental health for one. Yeah, and I saw a question there from, from Roy about just that. And I think, um, and you know, within the panel, we, we, we know people who have got some expertise both in um, well-being, but also the, the, the context of, of the contact centre, albeit it's a different contact centre now to what the one we're more familiar with. Um, but I think it's all about being 
um, trying to have that holistic view. So it was interesting that, you know, yourself and Simon know a great deal about the PCI, PCI guidance. And, um, you know, as Simon's described, a lot of people are catching up. We think we know what the rules are, and then we're having to try and have catch up with what they really are because they've shifted and our understanding's adjusted. But we can't look at any of these things in isolation. So, um, for instance, when it comes to data, the things we need to do around payment data and securing that, and hopefully uh, taking agents out of scope of the risk. So I, as an agent, doing my job, talking to a customer, resolving an issue, processing an order, don't have to worry about card data because I'm trying to do a good job. I'm trying to make this customer happy. I'm trying to get this transaction finished. Yeah. Um, so it's partly about that. And these things all combine. So the ICO, for instance, you know, explicitly says, if you're not following the PCI guidance, then you're, you, you're, you're going to be on our radar in terms of data breaches. And a big concern around having a distributed workforce is a data breach, personal data, personal data and, and payment data you know, don't literally always go hand in hand, but if you've got one, you're almost certainly going to have the other, particularly in the contact centre environment. So I think um, that there's a welfare and well-being aspect that's really important, but it's not divorced from uh, the financial side and the whole risk management piece. And in terms of regulation and compliance, I kind of think we all think about the regulators, but really there's, there's kind of three forces to my mind. So there's the regulators, and, you know, I described them a while ago as the light sleeping lions, They've backed off everybody. Certainly at the start of COVID, that's starting to change. Um, there's consumers, no a total wild card, because you know, consumers can be quite unconcerned about something until they are concerned about it. And then it's a big issue, particularly if you're on the front line, because you're going to get that consumer anxiety firsthand. And it's your stakeholders. And it's for I think particularly for outsourcers, they tend to have stakeholders, clients, who quite often are saying, don't do as I do, do as I say. I'm sure that's not the case of BT, Simon. Um, but, you know, outsourcers are used to often being led by clients who have a very clear view as to what they want to do. And in a regulatory and compliance space, that can be really advantageous. You can have a Simon effectively giving you free advice, good quality advice as a client, which is great. The flip side is you can have a client who doesn't really know what they, 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 they need, doesn't know what they don't understand what they want you to achieve, or have got a an incorrect view so then as an outsource you need to have that balance to have a sort of have done your risk analysis and say where's my vulnerabilities and we've seen outsource has been thrown under the bus through the period of covid when nervous or anxious or dissatisfied staff members have said i'm not being treated properly and if you're particularly if you're a subcontractor we all know no naming no names there's lots of government big large-scale government work being led by a master contractor who's subcontracting to lots of individual outsourcers. If you get some negative publicity, they'll drop you like a stone. And it's hard to do, but you need to try and do that risk analysis piece up front to protect your business and your people. Thank, thanks, Stevens. <clears throat> I just want to pick up on the sleeping lions and come over back to you, Felix. You know, what are the other sleeping lions out there that um, for our outsourcers as employers they need to be uh, mindful of. I think um, there, there's a there's a there's ones that you mentioned really there. It's about it's going to be about the people fundamentally. I mean, it's going to be there's going to be this tension between looking after people and managing them in one form or another. Um, I mean, you're going to get a whole you're going to get a whole lot of new software coming online now around welfare um, about measuring it. You're seeing it in Microsoft Teams now in the states where you can actually I mean you can literally you're seeing the state of your team. It's anonymous data, but it's how we, de how we deal with that as managers and leaders, that's quite interesting. Um, and um, as I say, the, um, the, the, you know, the, the powers that be in terms of the claims world and, uh, and the unions will be looking at that as well. They're, they're tricky. These are new skills, the new skills we've got to learn um, in this environment, which as I say, I think is an inevitable one because of the economic drivers. So um, nothing that we haven't covered before, but there's a lot of, a lot of new um, management skills. I think that's where that's where there's significant investment in terms of the uh, in terms of bringing to mid-term leadership up to up to uh, up to scratch to take advantage of this and realise that people are all different. Some people love this, really, really love it, 
Um, some people miss the office badly. Um, some people can, you know, they, they get much more, it's much easier to get at someone from a fraud point of view if they're at home. It's much easier to feel, to feel a little bit paranoid if you're at home about, you know, why am I not progressing in my, in, in the, my career, etc. There's you know, a whole there's set, a whole set of new skills, very, very interesting times. Um, but I don't think they're impossible to to uh, to deal with. I think we can deal with them. No, good point, Felix. And and of course, we can't afford all of that structural support that we can have in our centralised operating environments. And probably with the exception of the home working outsourcing specialists, so many more of us are having to rely on access controls on side by side support to support our people. <clears throat> We've just got a few minutes left. Brent, give us a quick summary um, from a tech standpoint for home working. Well, I, I think one thing we didn't cover, there, there's also a challenge with deploying these tools out to somebody working remotely. You know, the old days where if someone's in a call center, they sit down at a PC and they start working. Well, now you've got to get these securities out to the BWO routines securely and also you know, in this industry, you know, we see a lot of changes with employees, you know, coming on and off. So you've got to be able to switch them off as well, who are remotely. So, you, you know, it requires management tools as well uh, for book deployment and also, you know, regulating those users. Thanks, Brent. Final word from you, Steve. Um, yeah, I guess I suppose if I had any advice and I hesitate to do it, um, given I know a lot of people who will be listening to this. Um, I guess what the outsourcers have to strive to do, if possible, is to focus on the fundamentals and what is their proposition? What are they bringing to the table? And things are so fluid in terms of um, automation, technology, creativity to self-serve, the myriad different models you might have in terms of where you locate your staff and the, where you engage your staff and the rise of gig CX, which isn't a phrase I particularly like, but there's an awful lot going on and it's really hard to do that and keep your business going in a very, in what's probably going to be a prolonged recession. And I think if at all possible, if you can just retain, what is it that you bring to the table as an outsourcer? It's a competitive environment. There's a number of people who are, uh, you know, collaborators within the content center panel and or on this call who can do a great job. And I think if you can just have a clear view as to what you bring to the table, that's slightly different and distinctive that that's, you know, probably going to be your race card. And Simon, just a last word from you as a client and as a user of outsourcing services, how would you summarize? Yeah, just to follow up from what Steve said, really, you know, what, what is it that different providers give it, you know, competitors to, to myself, what am I looking for? You know, so from a, from a security standpoint, I'm looking for a clear defined boundaries of what you do and don't do, you know, make that whole engagement process as slick as possible uh, and be very clear about what the scope of the, data security, you know, your technology, your people, how they're working from home, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I guess that would be my my key takeaway as a different differentiator between the, the different third parties. And and of course, you're looking for some PCI compliance certification, I guess. Yeah, well, that's what I'm alluding to is the detail. <laughs> you know, I care about the, the devils in the detail. You know, I, I can get an AOC that's for the physical security or for opening the door in the contact center, whatever it is. And I've seen lots of different levels. So, so really, especially in this day and age, you know, what is it you can do for me and tell me about working from home scenarios um, that I can take away and make that journey really easy? Um, and then just following on, you know, we, we did an, in, uh, an internal survey about the status of people working from home. You know, to begin with, everybody was really happy to be working at home. But actually, nowadays, I think the survey said that actually only 46 percent of people were happy to be working from home. You know, the rest of them wanted to get back into the office with their colleagues. So I, I can see that working from home is definitely going to be there in the future. You know, I don't think we'll move away from having a contact center base as well. So really just keeping scope, you know, the, the PCI assessments or the data security scope should be both you're working from home environment and your um, contact center base. Thanks, Simon. JB, over to you. Great. OK, that's uh, thank you for that, Simon. Um, so, yeah, so I'm just a, just a thank you to the panelists today for uh, their contributions and for everyone obviously listening in. Um, I hope you found it very insightful. Um, just uh, just a, a little reminder, we have got some further webinars coming up. Uh, the dates we will release over the next few days. Uh, one's focused on home working health and safety considerations and legal risks. 
um, and the other is around how working well-being, which is actually been picked up on this uh, on this webinar as well. So that will continue on that topic particularly. Um, so yeah, so um, there's a small survey at the end of this uh, webinar. So if you could fill that in, uh, provide any information and feedback, it's all, all welcome. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you and have a good day. Yeah, thanks everybody. John, bye. Bye. Bye, bye everyone. Thank you.